Before we start to talk about the actual class math, I always feel like I need to do just sort of a very remedial introduction to percentages because I know for some of you, math is a four-letter word um, that you would rather not say. And that's okay if you feel that way. We will get you up to speed on the math. But this is not really real estate related. This is just dealing with percentages because almost all of the math that we deal with throughout the course of this class is based on percentages in one way or another. Everything's going to be a percent of something. Our commissions are going to be a percent of a sales price. Uh, um, property taxes are going to be some percent of an assessed value. Um, we Things appreciate in value by certain percentages or depreciate by certain percentages. Everything deals in percentages. And, and percent just really means per 100. That's all it means. When you talk about a percentage, it just means for every 100 of something, there are this many of it. So if, if you say 6% of something, that means for every 100, there are 6. If there's 6% of the balls are blue, then for every 100 balls, 6 of them are blue. If they're 72% you know, are pink, then for every 100 balls, 72 of them are pink. That's what a percentage means. As far as your calculator goes, hopefully you've all gotten a calculator by now. Um, we're going to talk about calculator usage. Your calculator is not very smart. This is a useful tool, but it is not smart. It is certainly not as smart as your phone is. Um, your phone is smart enough to tolerate you typing things in in the wrong order and it sort of figures out what you need or what you meant. Your calculator doesn't do that. And what's even scarier about a calculator is sometimes it doesn't even tell you to type it in the wrong order. It just gives you a nonsense answer and you think that's the real answer. So you have to be very careful about how you type things into a calculator. So for some of you who have never seen a calculator, um, millennials, I'm sorry, um, uh, we need to have a lesson in 1982 technology, the calculator. Um, and, and I teach this in a way that will work on everybody's calculator. Some calculators are slightly different with the way they work with things. The way I teach it works for everybody's calculator. Um, if your calculator handles things in a little bit of a shortcut method and you want to use that shortcut method, that's okay. Just remember that not every calculator always works that way and if yours were to break, like on the day of the exam, would you know how to adjust to using a different calculator? So I try to teach it in ways that can be used on every calculator. When we talk about percentages, the word of means multiply. So when you see 12% of, that of means multiply. So it's really 12% times $150,000. Here's the problem with that. Can't type it in your calculator that way. You can't type the percentage first. You have to type the real number first. So how are you going to type that into the calculator? What are you actually going to type into the calculator? $150,000. And, I, and I, 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 let me address the first thing I just heard there. Point whatever. Uh -uh. I know that's how you're used to it. Um, and that's how I used to do it. I was a decimal mover. You will make mistakes. Everybody does who move this decimal. I just, and so even I'm a convert. Use the percentage button. That's why they put one on there. Um, that's why it's there. It moves the decimal for you. Just discipline yourself out of it. Because I promise you, your brain needs nothing else on it. It, it sounds easy. Oh, I would never mistype 15% or 12%. I know that's 0 0.12. But what if they give you 0.1%? 0.7. No. See, right there. Aha, uh -huh. there we go. So that's why we use what? The percent button. That's what it's there for. Use it. So how are we going to type this into the calculator? $150,000 times 12%. That's how you're going to type it in the calculator. And that is how much money? 18,000. Well, that didn't say dollars. I shouldn't say how much money because it didn't say dollars. 18,000. How about 6% of 387,000? What am I typing into my calculator? $387,000 times 6%. And what is that? 
$23,220. You should learn, by the way, to calculate 6% of anything in your sleep. I'm not going to tell you why, but you know, it's just a, it's a, it's a, a number that seems to come up a lot around real estate transactions having to do with commissions. That's um, nice one, I'm sorry? That's a, nice one, That's a decent one. There's nothing wrong with that as a payday. You said 1% is not 0. 0.01? I said 0.1%. Point 0.1%. Point one percent. She still hung up on that. She does not want to use the percent. Because button. I'm like I'm calculating all the No, I'm just making up one that would traditionally throw people. That's what happens when all of a sudden you get like a point five percent. A lot of people put that in as point oh five, which is actually five percent, not point five percent. Again, it's just taking a thinking step out of things. Um, if there are 900 balls in a bucket and 9% of the balls are red, how many red balls are in the bucket? How would you type that into the calculator? 900 times what? 9%. How many are red? 81. 81. All right, number four. Travis sells his home for $250,000 and pays his real estate brokerage firm a commission amounting to 5% of the sales price. What is the total commission paid by the seller in the transaction? Well, that's 5% of $250,000, so how are we going to type that in the calculator? $250,000 times 5%. Was that $12,500? Sally works as a buyer's agent on a sale, and her firm is compensated 2.5% of the total sales price of $172,500. What's the firm's compensation for representation of the buyer? Same thing here. What are we typing into the calculator? 172,500 times 2.5%. $4,312.50. Is everybody okay with that? Is anybody having a problem finding the percent button on your calculator or anything like that? It's okay. If you are, we want to get it fixed. Everybody okay with their calculator so far? All right. Um, number six, Ahmad purchases a new home with a $285,000 sales price and finances the purchase by borrowing 80% of the total purchase price. What's his loan amount? So his loan is 80% of $285,000. So how do we type that in the calculator? 285000 times 80%. Two twenty-eight. Yeah. Two hundred and twenty-eight thousand dollars. Now, number seven gets much more into where people get hiccups sometimes. Um, I'm going to teach you a way to deal with percentage increases and decreases. Well, first of all, let's talk about the traditional way. A home has increased in value by 15% since it was last sold for 218. What's its new value? Can we take and figure out what 15% is of $218,000? Yes. Sure. So we can say $218,000 times 15%. And that will give us the increase in value, right? It's like 32,700 to me. But they don't want to know what the increase, they want to know what? The new value. So what are we going to have to do with that? We'd have to add it back to the original value. Two and that gives us a new value of $250,700. Is everybody okay with that number? Now, let me explain to you a way that you can tackle that that is number one much quicker and will prove to be very helpful. Sometimes shortcuts are not helpful, they're just shortcuts. This one is not only quicker, it will prove to be very helpful to you in the way your brain approaches percentages for the remainder of the class. When you talk about an adjustment based on percentages, and that's what this is, it's an adjustment because it's increasing in value by a certain percentage. Does everybody see that? 
or decrease would also be an adjustment. Anytime you talk about making an adjustment to something, we're raising the value of it, it appreciated, it went up in value, it started at 100%. And which way did it go? Up by how much? 15. Can you add 115 together? It's 115, right? 100 plus 15 is 115. Here's what we're really saying here. 115% of $218,000. Does that make sense for everybody? So how will we type that into the calculator? 218,000 times what? 115%. And if you do that, you should get the same 250, 700. Was that much quicker than figuring the 15% and then trying to add it back in? Add the percentages together first and then do one calculation. So look at the next one. Tommy works for Wake County approving new construction homes. Sorry, did you have your hand up, man? Yeah, what was um, uh, I, I mean, I did it that way, the way you did it right now. The second one? No, the first one. The first one? Um, but I just did it right now, um, plus 15%. I did plus, and it came out to the same answer. That is a shortcut I do not recommend okay. you use. That is the one, and then that's why I'm glad she asked the question. Did everybody hear her question? Let's try, let's play a game. Get, take your, pick up a calculator. All right, and I want you to type in $218,000 and then hit plus 15%. Now my calculator says $250,700. Does anybody have a different answer than that? Yes. Yes? That's why I don't recommend that shortcut. I don't, this is the world's greatest mystery of calculators. I don't know why some of them work with that and some of them do not. Is everybody okay with me on that? That's why I don't teach it that way. If they all work that way, I need you to like just hit plus 15% because it'd be it's certainly the easiest way to do it. The problem is what if you break your calculator in the morning of the test and you've got to borrow one and it won't do that. You, you see what I'm saying? I, so I don't want you to really rely on something that doesn't work 100% of the time. And you said yours came up with a different, what did yours come up with? A, a whole bunch of stuff just didn't work, yeah. Some of them, some of them come up with an answer that looks right, it's not even right, I mean, it's just a, diff, just a different answer. So. I mean, I always rather just do it the first one, the first way. And that's fine, whatever makes them, there's no, there's no right or wrong here. This is just as right as this, okay? So look at the second one. Tommy works for Wake County Improvement New Construction Homes. Last year, 28,000 new homes were approved. This year, Tommy's seen an increase of 8%. How many new homes have been approved this year? Well, there's two ways we can do that. Can we take 28,000 and multiply it times 8%? Yes. Yep. All right, we'll do it that way. 28,000 times 8%. is 2,240. And that's the increase over last year, right? What do we have to do with that number? We have to add it back to the 28,000. And so we've got 30,240 homes approved this year. Is everybody all right with that? What's the alternative way we can do it? Since it's a percentage adjustment, what percentage do we start with? 100%. Which way are we going, up or down? Uh, up. by how much? 8%. 8%. So what's our new number? 108. 108%. 108%. So we can just take the $28,000 and multiply times 108%, and that will give us the exact same answer, $30,240. Everybody okay with that? Look at number nine. Latasha is a sales agent who earned $122,000 in the sales commission last year. Unfortunately, she's seen a 7% decrease in her income this year due to the illness that has kept her home. What is her income this year? 
Well, the same thing we just did in the previous question with an increase, we can do here with a decrease. What percentage are we starting at whenever we're making an adjustment up or down? 100. Which way are we going? Down by how much? 7. So what percentage are we left with? 93%. So we can simply say $122,000 times 93% And this year she would make $113,460. Which would be the exact same answer you would get if you took $122,000 and multiplied times 7% and then subtracted that number from the one twenty two. dollars but this is one less step. And it helps you get in the right mindset of percentages, what we're actually doing with percentages. Because that starting from a target of 100% is going to be so helpful later on when we get to things like net listing prices and all those kinds of things. Everybody okay with that? Why don't you take a second and do number 10 then? Just make sure you guys are, I'll give you just a second to do that one on your own real quick. This is a percentage adjustment question. We started at 100%. Which way are we adjusting? Up or down? Down by how much? 14%. So 100 minus 14 leaves us with what? 86%. So it's going to be 426,000 times 86%, which is 366,360. How do we all feel about those, that stuff? Quite honestly, if you can do that, then you can do the math in this class. Now, are there going to be formulas you have to learn? Yes. Are you going to have to learn how to deal with different types of numbers? Yes. But all of it's going to revolve back to these percentages all the time. So if you can understand this very basic concept of just how to deal with percentages on your calculator, you're going to be okay in the math, I promise. All right? Does anybody have any questions? Or are we okay? To kind of jump back into the lecture and talk about how we're going to apply this to real world questions. Yes, ma'am. Ma what, what was the other way you said that you could um, calculate this? And I could simply take the $426,000 and calculate the 14% decrease which is 59000 oops, not 56 59640 Okay, and then take 426, because that was our starting point, and subtract the 59640 And it should give me the exact same answer, 366, 360. Okay. That's the way I would do it. Okay, and that's fine. Okay. There's nothing wrong with doing it that way. Just keep in mind, you still have to, conceptually, you're going to need to get to a point where the other way makes sense. Because later on in the class, when we get to things that rely on being able to make percentage adjustments up and down, you won't have the option of doing the long way. Your, your brain is going to have to work in the shortcut way. That's the only reason I show it to you this early. But that's okay as you get more comfortable to start to work with it. Okay. Okay? Just remember the most important concept is you always start with 100% of something. Before you start adjusting it one way or another, you're starting at 100%. And then you go up or down from there. So like for example, just to give you an example of what I mean, if a seller's paying a 6% commission, they're not really keeping all of the transaction, are they? What percentage are they keeping? 94%. They're keeping 94% because they started with 100% of the transaction but they paid out 6% of it. Does that make sense for everybody? And so that's what, 
later on, it's going to be really important to make sure your brain is clicking in that order. So I'm trying to introduce it pretty early. What's the average commercial nowadays like? Well, see, I will forgive you for right now because we're early in the class. You just asked me to commit a felony by answering that question. <laughs> There's actually a law called the Sherman Antitrust Act, and that is a violation of that law for me to ask, answer that question because in theory there should be no average commission. Commission is supposed to be an individually negotiated thing. In other words, I am supposed to negotiate commissions with each individual client that I work with, and I should never compare my commissions to what other people charge. Because if there's no standard, there's no way for me to compare. Does that make sense? By saying, oh, well, you know, I, I charge 2% less than everybody else, that makes it sound like everybody else charges the same thing, which is not true. Does that make sense? Now, I know what you're trying to ask, and I'll be happy to answer it. The most common number um, is 6%. That is the most common number that you'll see in the marketplace. It has been the entire time I've been in the business. That does not mean that will always be the most common number, but that is the most common number on the residential side of things, um, on residential sales. Um, I should qualify that by saying on residential sales, six is a very common number. Yes, ma'am? But that's only if it's not split. No, that's the commission. Okay. I didn't say one person got to keep it all, Miss Greedy over there said that before. <laughs> I, that, but six is the most common, and I know what you're saying too. Yeah. And she's thinking about, well, aren't there multiple agents and firms that have to split that? And the truth is, yes, there is. Because generally speaking, you would have not only a firm representing the seller, but also a firm representing the buyer. And we're not going to charge separate commissions. That commission is going to get what? It's going to get divvied up and get split up between them. But six is a very common number. Five is a common number as well. Uh, I mean, the, the, but there are firms that do it for three and a half percent. There are firms who do it for eight percent. But you know, if you researched, I think you would find six would be the, by far the most yeah, common number. Especially if you're on a provisional status, you got to pay your percentage to your broker in charge. Well, right. I mean, and, and whether you're on provisional status or not, if you have a broker in charge, they aren't working for free. They're going to want to split. They're going to want to cut a piece of the action. Right? The way of the world. The way of the world. Could, yeah. we, could we consider an unfair competency when you lower your rate so much? Can, in other words, if somebody is charging a low amount, can we assume they don't know what they're doing? Is that sort of. No, 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 no. It's if you can consider that this person is working against, uh, with an unfair competency. With an inferred competency, I'm not sure what you mean. Uh, you mean they're less qualified? No, the competencia is real. You said the person who is being unfair, the person he's working with is being unfair regarding the the inner, I mean the percentage of the commission. Unfair business practice. Charge like a unusually low amount. Yeah. Um. Or unusually high. Well, the, but see, the thing is, there shouldn't be anything unusual. That, that, that's the whole idea. Um, the, I, I get what your question is. I mean, unfair is a tough word for me to answer the question around because the whole idea is there shouldn't be anything unusually high or low because they should all be individually negotiated. That's what they would tell you in a perfect world, that there is no such thing as a normal commission because you charge what you charge. That's just considered the broker market. That's the marketplace. That's exactly right. In other words, when you're trying to determine what you should charge for your commission, you shouldn't be looking at what other people are charging. You should just be looking at this is what makes sense for my business model. Now, we all know that's not going to be the case. But, but um, that's... Yeah, that's uh, for example, if you put a, an advertisement in the newspaper and say, don't pay 6% if you say that your house. We charge just 4%. That's fine, as long as you don't say something like, don't pay the 6% everybody else charges you. It's when you make, you can say don't pay 6% because you're not comparing yourself to other folks. But if you say, you know, most real estate brokers will charge you 6%, we'll only charge you 4 that's a violation of the law. You can't make that sort of comparison statement. Yes, ma'am. As a non-provisional, are you allowed to determine what percentage? Um, it's always going to be the broker in charge's choice. Um, ultimately, because they run the firm. Now, most brokers in charge 
pass that responsibility on to their affiliated brokers. I mean, the vast majority of BICs that I know don't get involved with individual commissions on individual transactions. They simply give their brokers the right to make that decision. But ultimately, the decision legally rests with the broker in charge. So you know, that'll be something to discuss with your broker in charge about how much leeway you have and what you charge. I mean, they, here's how they fix that. I'll give you an example. Like, um, if you hang your license with a um, big red firm, I don't say that. Um, <laughs> two letters, big red. Um, but um, if you hang your license with at the K and W, I mean, sorry, um, uh, that's a cafeteria, right? That's not a real estate firm. But if you hang your license there, their commission split is that they get thirty percent of the tramp. But if you read more in detail. What it says is they get 30% of the anticipated 3% that they think you should be generating on the transaction. They will calculate their split based on you being paid 3% whether you're actually paid 3% or not and you're going to get whatever's left over. So you're realistically only going to get 70% if you were actually charging what? Three. If you charge less, the cut's coming all from your side not from theirs. So in that regard, they really don't care what you charge because you're cutting your own throat, not theirs. But if you charge more? If you charge more, then they'll get 30% of it. They get it going and coming. And that's not just them. That's every firm for the most part. So you need to pay special attention to what your independent contractor agreement says about commissions and splits and that sort of thing. Because I've had people who ended up working for free on a transaction because you know, they thought they were doing a favor to somebody by cutting the, trans the, the commission, and they were. They just didn't realize they were cutting it completely from their side, and their firm was still getting a full split. So that's going to depend on your independent contractor agreement. Okay, everybody good? All right, so let's go back over, and we're not going to get very far, but I do want to get through the lecture part of this, and then we'll pick up the math of it um, tomorrow with property taxation. We'll talk about the, the calendar and the idea um, first, and then we will talk about the math of it first thing tomorrow. So in North Carolina, property taxation is done what we call ad valorem. That's just, it's Latin, that means based on value. Property taxes, the amount we pay in property taxes in North Carolina is completely based on something called the assessed value of the property. So you need to get very comfortable with that phrasing, assessed value. Not market value, but assessed market value. The reason we call it assessed market value is because the county is going to tell you what your house is worth. And not just houses, all property whether it be commercial property, residential property, agricultural property, the county is going to assess what they believe the property is worth. And that is going to be the basis for your tax bill. Are there going to be times when you disagree with the county's assessment of the value of your property? Absolutely. Tough luck. Because your taxes are going to be based on what the county believes the property is worth. Is everybody with me on that? That's what an ad valorem tax is based on. Now you need to understand, this is county-wide, city-wide, not statewide. There are no state-level property taxes. These are local property taxes. Now, you also should be familiar with something called the Machinery Act. The Machinery Act, and I don't know why it's called the Machinery Act, I have no idea. The Machinery Act is the law, Act just means law. That's the name of the law in North Carolina that gives your county the right to charge you property taxes. It's the name of the law that sets up how property taxes operate in the state of North Carolina. Because the counties don't have the right to tax you unless they get that power from where? From the state. It's the state who has all the authority, and they give this authority out to your local municipalities, your county and your city. And by the way, if you live in a city, which taxes are you going to pay? County taxes or city taxes? Both, because if you live in a city, you live in both the county and the city, and you're going to pay both. If you live in just the county, which one are you going to pay? Just county. Just county. Okay? So make sure you know the Machinery Act. Now, the Machinery Act sets up a system where 
the assessed value of the property is supposed to be its full market value. Now, some states use some percentage of market value. Like, for example, Michigan uses 50% of market value for assessed tax purposes. So whatever they say your property's worth, they first do what with it? Chop it in half, right? They multiply it times 50%. In North Carolina, we don't do that because we use a full market value approach. So whatever the full assessed market value of your property is, that's going to be the basis for your taxation here. So we keep saying assessed value. Let's talk about when this assessment happens and who does it. The county does it. And they're required by this law to do it once every eight years. Years. You need to know that for test taking purposes. They are required to revalue your property once every eight years. That's called an octennial reappraisal. So that means once they come out and value your property, how long is that value going to stick to your property for tax purposes? Eight years. For eight years. For eight years. Okay? Now, an octennial reappraisal is a very involved thing. See, we don't do Stephanie's property today and Edgar's property next year. If they're in the same county, guess when they're going to get reassessed? At the same time. And we have to physically visit every single property in the county during that octennial reappraisal. Is that a big task? Think about Wake County. To visit every single piece of real property in Wake County to reassess the values all at once. That's a huge task, is it not? And they have to visit every single one of them because the, the interesting thing about an octennial reappraisal is the state requires it to be property by property. They can't like apply some fancy algorithm and just say, oh, property values have gone up by 10%, so we're going to bump them all up 10%. They have to literally visit and take pictures of every single property in the county. That's why they, only, that's why they have eight years to get it done because it takes a long time. Does that make sense for everybody? And so everybody's property value is going to change all at the same time at that octennial reappraisal. And then you're going to be locked in for how long? For eight years. Except they can make an adjustment halfway through. It would be half of eight. Four. At the four-year mark, they're allowed to make an adjustment. Now that adjustment is very different from an octennial reappraisal. That adjustment is called a horizontal adjustment right here. Here's the difference between a horizontal adjustment. Is it possible in an octennial reappraisal for Kevin's property to go up in value while Bryce's property goes down in value? Yes. Yeah, because they are being individually valued, right? That cannot happen in a horizontal adjustment. In a horizontal adjustment, they don't actually visit any property in the county. They take a flat across the board, either increase or decrease. So right now, Wake County is about to make a horizontal adjustment next year. It's been So how long has it been since they've done their octennial reappraisal? Four. Four. It will be four next year. So how long has it been right now? It's three. been three. They did their octennial reappraisal three years ago. Why do you think they want to take a horizontal adjustment next year? What if property value is done in the last three years in Wake County? They've increased significantly, correct? So which way do you think that horizontal adjustment is going to go next year? Oh. Uh, now, are they going to visit my house in Cary to see how much my house is worth? No, because what are they going to do? They're going to raise every property in Wake County by one flat across the board adjustment. 10%, 15%, whatever that number happens to be. They're saying 12. That's what I've heard. The most recent number. 12% across the board every property would go up by 12%. Does that make sense? That's very different from the octennial reappraisal because in the octennial reappraisal, each property is valued how? Individually. 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 So, yes. So the, the increase mm -hmm. you're talking about is not going to be market value. It's going to be tax value. Tax value. Assessed tax value. Right. Okay. Correct. But remember, what they're trying to accomplish is to better indicate market value. The whole idea is that the assessed tax value is supposed to be equal to the market value. And so the reason they're taking that correction is because market values have done what since they were last reassessed at the last octennial reappraisal? They've gone up. Gone up. Yes, ma'am. So does that mean one of the four years after they do this? 
horizontal adjustment? Yeah. If your property goes down, though, your the property taxes will go down too. Well, and it, what it means is that don't associate your assessed value. Can your assessed value go up and your property tax bill go down? Yes, because what can change every single year? The tax rate. This has nothing to do with the rate, folks. This is simply what they value your property at. So think of it like taxes on, you know, when you get your tax bill on your car. What's the first place you look up there when you see how much they charge you in taxes? What do they, what do they have right over there? What the car is what? Worth. Worth. That's what we're talking about here. We're talking about the valuation of the property. We're not talking about the actual tax bill. We're talking about the valuation of the property. So when Wake County takes a horizontal adjustment upward next year, that does not necessarily mean my tax bill is going to go up. It probably does. If they take the value up and leave the tax rate the same, will my tax bill go up? If the value of my property goes up and they leave the tax rate the same, is my tax bill going to go yes, up? Yes. yes, because I'm paying the same rate on a higher valued house. My tax bill would absolutely go up. These folks are politicians. <laughs> we'll teach you the power of politicians right here. Your Wake County commissioners next year are going to campaign on the fact that they gave you a property tax cut. Because they are, but they're not. They're going to cut the rate. But at the same time, what are they doing? Increase the value. So your tax bill may be what? Higher. Higher, but they'll be campaigning on the fact that we cut your property taxes. So they do a horizontal adjustment. Raise the values. Raise the value. Vote for a lower tax rate. Then they do a lower tax rate. Uh-huh. And that's what you're saying. Uh-huh. Because I talk to people at the assessor's office about what they're considering doing. Yes, sir. Yeah. This may be a question for me because I just bought a house, a brand new house, mm -hmm. um, and they did come out and took all the measurements to the value and stuff. Will that still be increased by the 12% even though they just did it last year? It's Flat across the board. <laughs> <laughs> they will get you. I just got to notice how the Johnson County did come out and says it's not one more. Uh huh. John, Johnson County is due for their octennial reappraisal next year. Yep. That was the don't shoot us notice. If you see us probing around your property, we're just trying to figure out how much it's worth so we can tax you on it. It's not supposed to be the same flat uh, percentage. It only in a horizontal adjustment. And in octennial reappraisal, it doesn't have to be the same at all. You could have one house here that goes up in value and the next door neighbor's house goes down in value because they are valued individually with the octennial reappraisal. When we do a horizontal adjustment, if we do it, not every county does them, but if they do it, it's at the halfway point, so four years, and that has to be a flat across the board adjustment. That's required by law to be a flat across the board adjustment. So that means uh, sometime within eight years, your house is gonna be reassessed? At least every eight years. Okay. Yes, my, my house individually is gonna be assessed every eight years. Every so, do you know when was the last time you were? Three years ago. Three years ago. So, they have an eight year window to do it again? They will do it, and it won't be in an eight year window. It will be in year eight. Okay. It has to happen in that year. Okay. It has to happen in that year. So, they'll. So the last time Wake County did it was 2015, and will happen again in 2023. Oh, okay. We'll be in, we'll, when Wake County has their next octennial reappraisal. What the counties try to do is stay on a different cycle from each other because there are only so many appraisers to go around. They don't have enough appraisers at the county tax assessor's office. They hire outside appraisers to come in and help with that. So Durham County is on a different cycle than Wake County is on a different cycle than Orange is on a different cycle. Like, so Johnson's having their octennial reappraisal next year. Wake County's halfway through our cycle. And I think Orange is the year after Johnson. And then Durham is the following year, and then it'll be back to Wake. And so they, they kind of keep them on, on alternating schedules so that there's enough appraisers to go around. Okay. The key is understanding the difference between the properties being individually valued at the eight-year mark versus they can take that flat adjustment at year number four. Is everybody okay with that? Okay. So when the appraiser goes out to my house in 2023, what are they supposed to be trying to predict? What the house would what? 
would sell for, what its value is, what it would sell for that day. And then that value is going to stay locked to the property for tax purposes. The only thing it matters for is tax purposes for at least how many years? Four. At least four. Should be eight, but they might do what at the four-year mark? They may take the horizontal adjustment, but it will definitely be there for at least four. Most of the time, eight. Is there a trigger that they, or a right word of, Indicator Rapid state. increases or decreases in value are what usually trigger a horizontal adjustment. Yeah. So, I mean, if you look at Wake County's schedule, Wake County allows you to get it in 2015, which means the year the year before that was 2007. So think about what was happening in 2007. The market was going dramatically up. Well, so we're still going up in 2007. So then when we got to 2011, they did a horizontal adjustment. Um, in 2011, they did a horizontal adjustment and went which way? Down. down. Dramatically down because property values from 2007 to 2011 had dropped precipitously. So they did a horizontal adjustment downward in 2011. And then, of course, in 2015, they did a new assessed value. And now they're doing a horizontal adjustment the other way. Does that make sense for everybody? Yeah. Better. cycle so far now last thing we want to talk about before you I will let you go today is the actual schedule now you have to not get lazy when you deal with this schedule don't just say dates say years because you will psych yourself out if you don't these are spread over two different years not one year it's not January 1 and then January 6, five days later. It's a year and five days later. Does that make sense for everybody? So this is January 1 of 2018. This is January 6 of what? 2019. So you've got to make sure you understand this process is spread over the course of more than a year. Is everybody with me so far? So here's what you need to understand. Your property taxes, if you own real property in North Carolina, become a lien on the first day of the year, January 1. So my 2018 property taxes in Wake County, are they already a lien on my property? Yes. Yes, yes they are. They have been a lien since January 1. Yeah. Now, what do we say a lien was? Right. The right to collect a debt, right? And if I don't pay the debt, the right to do what? To foreclose on my property. That's exactly what property taxes represent, a right by the county to foreclose on the property. Here's what's interesting. Prior to about three weeks ago, I couldn't even tell you how much that lien was for. Because even though they became a lien on January 1, they aren't billed until September. So I didn't even know how much I owed, but I know I owed. That, you, when you write the rules, you get to make them up silly shit like that, right? You get to do stuff like that. And so it became a lien nine months before I actually knew how much a lien was for. Now, can I figure out how much a lien is for now? Yes, because the property tax bills are out. So I know exactly how much money I owe Wake County at this point in time. So you need to know that calendar. In January 1, taxes become a lien for the current year. September of that same year, they are billed. So they're due as soon as they're billed. As soon as the bill comes out, they're due and payable. The other date that really matters, in fact, the most important date, is when they become delinquent. They are delinquent on January 6th of next year. So my 2018 property taxes become delinquent if I have not paid them before January 6th of 2019. And if they go delinquent, what does that mean I have opened myself up to? Foreclosure by the county for non-payment of property tax. Everybody okay with that? So that creates a challenge for us as we deal with real estate transactions because do we have closings before September? Oh, yeah. yeah. So do people owe property taxes if they sell their house in June? Yes, yes they do. How much do they owe? 
Nobody knows. Nobody knows. So what do you think we use? We use the best thing we have to go by, which is what? Last year's bill. We use last year's bill. Is that always going to be off by a few bucks? Probably. But it's the best information we've got at the time. So we prorate it based on the previous year's bill. Now, if we close today, will we use the previous year's bill? No. No, because we actually have the bill now. We will use this year's bill if we close September, October, November. But if we're closing in April, we got to use last year's bill. So like in the case of somebody like Kevin, for example. Kevin's is really tough. He just bought a new construction house. What was the assessed value of that property last year? Significantly less, because it was what? Vacant piece of land. So when they use last year's tax bill to estimate this year's, is that going to be a good estimation? Uh-uh. Hopefully somebody has done a better job of estimating than that. And that's why they came out to visit your property, because they have to put a new assessed value on that property so that they can calculate the tax bill for next year. And it's important to estimate those in advance because he's probably escrowing his property tax payments. He's probably paying monthly in. And you don't want that to be escrowed wrong. Because if they base it on last year's, and taxes last year were probably only like $300 because it was a vacant piece of land, and now the taxes this year are going to be $4,000, is his escrow account going to be way short if they are escrowing based on last year's tax bill? Sure. I don't know what it was, but I think we got like $1,800 back last year, and of course this year is paying more. Yep. To try to account for it. Yep. To make an adjustment for the increase. Yes, sir. Uh, tell me if I'm out of bounds here. We can move on. You're out of bounds. Not yet. <laughs> so, with the mortgage company, right, they have their, a lot of times that escrow will change. You'll get a letter that says, hey, we need to redo your escrow. When the new bill comes out. And they usually do that once the new bill comes out mm -hmm. because they're only going by. The previous years. That's right. exactly. Your escrows are based on last year's tax bill. Right. And so, when the new bill comes out, if they realize, hey, we haven't collected enough money, they have to adjust, but they're already nine months into the year. So they've already collected too right. little right. for nine months, so they have to play catch up. Yeah, so if your property values are going up, you're going to be constantly getting a letter if your escrow is going to be changed. Absolutely, every year. That's right. That's exactly right. Okay? Everybody good on this calendar? Yeah. All right. So here's what I want you to do for homework. I don't give you much homework on the night between classes, and this is really simple. I want you to turn back to before the slide packet. Uh, you should have your um, formula packet up there. It looks like a bunch of circles. It's the, I think it's the first thing. It might be right behind the license law rules. So syllabus and then license law rules. It's before you get into the chapter slides. First thing is your commission rules. It'll be the next packet. It's, it's, it's stable together. It's got a bunch of circles. Yeah. Those are your math formulas. Everybody see what I'm talking about? So your homework is to memorize all of them. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, I, what I want you to do is memorize the ones on, can I flip for a second? I want you to memorize the um, ones on property taxation and mill rates for tomorrow. And I also want you to look at the acreage, cost per square foot, cost per acre, government rectangular surveys, and excise taxes. So all the way up through excise taxes. Now, in memorizing these formulas, these are all just a picture. Notice it's just a circle, right? We call them T-bars, by the way. There's always two things on the, uh, uh, there's always one thing on top and two things on the bottom in every T-bar. I don't want you to understand the T-bar yet. We're going to talk about that extensively tomorrow. What I want you to do is memorize the picture. So make a flashcard for yourself. When you look at, for example, property tax math, if you flip over to the formula for property taxes, what you'll see is that on the top of it is the property tax bill. Does everybody see that's on top? Yeah. And then on the bottom, you have the assessed value and the tax rate. Does that make sense? Yeah. Can you make a flashcard for yourself? Yeah. Where you just memorize what's on top and then what's on bottom? Trust me, if you can do that, you can work with any formula in this class. That's the magic of a T-bar, because it's all about just knowing that picture. If you know the picture, you can work with the formula. We'll talk about that tomorrow. And that's your homework for tomorrow. Okay? Is commission too? I'm sorry? Commission? No, not that far. Okay. Just excise taxes. Okay. Through excise taxes. Perfect. Yes? So, in, that, in the unit quiz, uh, I think it was 
that was chapter three, we probably, probably had it anyway. I took that 14, it says, 